Hey, Slick Talkers, thank you so much for tuning into this podcast, and I know that if you love this show, you'll also love my morning show called Good Morning Hospitality with my co-hosts Michael Golden and Brandy Canale as we spend 30 minutes every Monday morning to dive into the industry's top latest news and trending topics. So go check it out on wherever you find your podcasts at Good Morning Hospitality, and you can live stream with us on Monday mornings on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and of course, YouTube. Now, I hope you enjoy this episode. Episode. It's almost like this positive reinforcement thing, right? Like I kind of don't think about the negative and only think about this really incredible experience I have. And I said it earlier, but I have this like calling to pay it forward. And I like want to identify people like she identified me and pour into them as much as I possibly can so they can pass it on and pass it on. And it's like this responsibility that I feel like I have now. <laughs> What's up, Slick Talkers? I want to do dynamic duo sponsorship placements for our partners, and the best dynamic duos I could put together for you are our first one of Hostfully and Minute. Now, you probably heard our Minute with Minute segment with Nathan Smith over at Minute. If I could say Minute a thousand times, then I will. But basically, if you are using Hostfully's property management platform, then you can go to their integration marketplace and turn on your integration with Minute. So that way, everything is operating seamlessly in your hub to run your business without any issues and headaches. It just is so nice to have proper integration partners together. And I couldn't be more thankful for these two partnering with us on the podcast. So make sure you check out the show notes because we have special offers just for you from both companies, Hostfully and Minute, because you're a listener of the podcast and they love taking care of our listeners. So Check out the links in the show notes. And of course, like always, thank you for tuning into the podcast. Now, back to the episode. All right, Slick Talkers, welcome back to another episode of the podcast. And this is a special one because I get to double dip guests sometimes being a host of multiple shows in our podcast network. I had Megan Moylan, who is with Outpost out in Jackson Hole, and we got to talk at the TravelNet user conference. I got to learn about her business through the lovely ladies at Sojo, and getting to talk to her and broadcast at their booth, I pretty much came up to her at the end of the recording and was like, hey, I need to have you on my other show because there's a deeper conversation that we can do without having a bunch of people at a conference walk by and take pictures of us and all this stuff. So Megan, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing today? I'm so good. I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for having me. I hope we have as much fun as we did last time. I think so. Oh, we're not in our beautiful morning studio set up with coffee and all that stuff like we had at TravelNet, but Mm -hmm. Hey, virtual, getting a double dip and have you on the podcast again is always a pleasure. So I'm excited for what's ahead. Me too. I I want you to open up the floor. Basically, let's get a 60 second high level overview, where you got started, where you're at today, what the business is and what you guys do. And then we'll jump right in. Yeah, of course. So I said this on the last podcast, but I am one of those that fell into the industry, like I think everybody in the industry is. And I started in the Panhandle of Florida right out of college in reservations, which I also feel like is a really common story for a company called 360 Blue down in San Jose Beach, Florida, along the stretch of 30A and in Destin. And we had about 200 units at the time. Stayed with the company for about six years and did a whole bunch of different things from revenue, running the biz dev team, all the way up to chief strategy officer, which I exited in 2021, uh, late 2021. And during that time, we also, I got to be part of Key Data at the beginning of Key Data, which was so incredible and such an awesome experience, which is a BI tool for revenue managers and marketers in the industry. And then after that, I had connected with uh, the owner of my company now at a conference, actually the Verma Executive Summit. And I reached out to him when I was thinking about new options and said like, hey, I know you're in Jackson Hole, but you have this like incredible company, really cool culture. I think I want to be a part of it. Do you have any openings? Just a co- total cold reach out on LinkedIn. And he was like, you should come up to Jackson and let's have coffee and talk about it. And so I came up to Jackson. We totally hit it off. He was awesome. Had built this really incredible business here and had spun up a couple other businesses too. And so it was like, okay, let's do this. I moved up to Jackson and it's been about two two years now, like next week, I think 
And we have 250 units here in Jackson, it's kind of all over the board. So we have super lux, we have multifamily units, single family units, and I really love it so far. It's been such a cool experience. And we have five other businesses in Jackson too, which take up a lot of time as well. So we're kind of doing a little bit of everything now, but yeah. I love it. Okay. So this is where it's going to get fun for all the listeners because uh, I don't really do like pre-screen questions, but knowing our conversation on the first time, you know, getting to kind of come up some conversation or topic starters, you, you mentioned working your way up through 360, you got up to the chief strategy officer role. Now you're an executive again at the company that you're at, at Outpost. And so basically I want to talk basically giving the listeners some context in your first episode, we talked about the vertically integrated kind of business model for outposts as a whole, as a group. So you have Mm -hmm. your property management side, you have your snow removal, you have cleaning now coffee roastery and a coffee shop. You have all these services and businesses kind of vertically integrated, but they're also standalone, super Mm -hmm. important. So to set you up for this question, a lot of team members or employees of businesses can sometimes have whiplash where the entrepreneur, the founder is shiny object syndrome. And I've been guilty of this, but I'm getting better. So for any of my mentors out there that are listening, I know, I know I have an, an issue sometimes. But it's like, a visionary it's, thing. It, it is. It's a hundred percent a visionary thing. And you mm-hmm. see how they all tie together, but obviously there's a roadmap and a timeline that kind of has to happen in order for it to finally get to that vision. So a short way or actually a long way of asking you this question, you've been able to see not only outposts start or spin up a new business inside of the group, but also acquire. Now I'm going to label you as an entrepreneur because you've been able to be inside of a startup basically and create this whole thing in this ecosystem. How do you, or how has the team handled any potential type of whiplash that can really happen when it comes up with new business, new offerings, especially with you mentioning you have a portfolio with super lux to multifamily, single family, you know, the consistency and the standardization and the operations and all the geeky things that we could talk about. I would love to know, kind of give me the 411 of whiplash and how that kind of works. Oh, yeah. God, I love this question so much. Okay, so it's really funny. I was meeting with my career coach this morning, actually, and I've kind of gone through this identity crisis lately of like, am I a visionary or am I an integrator? And I mean, with all the EOS talk that's happening in the industry. Okay, so I think that I am an integrator that maybe wants to be a visionary, but is an integrator at heart. And I struggle with this because I am a both person. Like we both have both traits, right? Like I'm a visionary, but I have like those integrator moments, but I can't sustain that, right? I'm not an an integrator that can consistently be an integrator. I can only do it for periods at a time versus probably I could imagine you, you're an integrator, but sometimes that vision just kind of takes off and then you have to like, oh shit, I got to come back down really quick. And totally. Actually, yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, I think I very much value. I'm someone that like hates the corporate world, but I really value structure. And so I think that's maybe in a lot of visionaries, I know like they're like structure can come later. Like here's the idea. Here's the next idea. Here's the next idea. And, but I also really love change. Like I am a super adaptable person. So if we're not changing or like doing something new or whatever for three to six months, I will literally be like, okay, so what's the next thing? What are we doing over here? I'm pretty bored. Like, And that I think is where I struggled and kind of felt like an in-betweener because I think a lot of the time the integrators are the ones that are like, hold off. We can't do anything else right now. We're super busy. The team is super inundated when I am the total opposite, but also valuing structure. So with that being said, when I started, it was really interesting. All of the vacation rental company called Outpost was really like assisting with the other entities. And at the time, we had a catering and private chef company, a cleaning company, and a snow removal and landscaping business. So our marketing team that was hired on an outpost for vacation rentals started, it was like, hey, we're also going to do this other thing. And it was just more and more to their plate. And same with the finance team. And I think a lot of employees at the vacation rental company were like, oh my gosh, we have this major business that's really at this point, the most successful and lucrative business that we have. So we want to pour all of our time and energy into this, but we also have all of these other now vertically integrated businesses here. But 
when you're so in the day to day, you're like, it just feels like another thing, you know? Um, And so when I started, I really had this idea where I wanted to create a holding or a parent company and bring over the marketing team, the finance team, the HR team, and, and clearly communicate with the employees like, hey, I know that you were hired on to do marketing for Outpost, the vacation rental company, but I, we have this larger vision and I think it's more opportunity for you or opportunity for the companies, give you some diversity in what you're doing every single day and really kind of build this like core group, the trunk of the tree, if you will. Um so that maybe that was like a horrible metaphor, but no, yeah. I, I no, I I love that. I I think the <laughs> trunk of the tree. That's a great. That's a great way to describe it. Yeah, and so that kind of became our core like parent company model. And so we have the Outpost Group, which I'm the d- executive director of the Outpost Group. And what we do, so we do all of the creative direction, marketing, digital marketing, both sides of marketing for every entity that we have underneath the umbrella or in the in the branches, if you will. I can't like switch from metaphor to metaphor. And then we have finance, does finance for all of the entities, HR, does HR for all of the companies. And then we have an operations and strategy department, which really like works with each business leader to identify objectives and set that next strategy. And then we honestly like kind of help out in whatever way possible. So if that is, hey, you need help with staffing for the coffee shop, like we'll assist with that. Hey, you need to vet these three softwares on the vacation rental side because we're experiencing need problems. But it gives power to the executives of each individual company to run the day to day and be super involved and lead the strategy as well. And then just kind of we're here to support and make sure we're all rolling in the right direction. I love it. This is uh, so I guess it might be a harder can of worms to open up, but with that diversity like diversity of problem solving, I think is really, it's a great thing. I, I'm, again, as a visionary, I love to be kind of doing multiple things at once that I'm like, okay, this all makes sense in the bigger picture. Da, 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 da. Then I have those days where I'm like, okay, I am I just want to focus and get my to-do list done on X, Y, and Z things. I, I need to start like tweaking this system or tweaking that system. But like with this, have you guys seen, because I think you know, I was listening to another podcast outside of our industry. The CEO of Kayak was basically describing how companies like Vicasa, Sonder, and other even hospitality brands that aren't just short-term rental related, how we're all struggling with profitability. And so no one's been able to seem profitable. And so with this model, do you guys see that the the numbers of financials really do make sense to have a more vertically integrated business than to have one business that stands alone and just focuses on property management versus X, Y, and Z services and products. I would love to know your your take on that. Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, during COVID, if it, if it taught us anything, it was more like, what can we do to diversify our assets, but also set our main cash cow up for success as well and control as much of the guest and the owner experience as possible while still really like protecting ourselves in other areas if the vacation rental industry doesn't survive COVID then we have these other businesses that aren't nearly as lucrative, but snow removal, for example, we're always going to need to remove snow, especially in a place like Jackson Hole. It just, it it is what it is. The coffee roasting business, mainly our wholesale clients where our, a large portion of our income comes from our grocery stores. So big grocery store chains like Whole Foods, for example. And it just, it felt like a little bit of extra security that's been helpful. I mean, I will not say that all those businesses were profitable right off the bat. Like it was definitely an investment to get started in both time and money. But we actually, and I kind of hate saying this because I know that a lot of people have not had this experience. Outpost is at the best year yet in terms of financials in 2023, which is super, super exciting. And I think a totally different experience than a lot of other people in the industry. And so that has also just helped catapult us to the next level with all of the entities. 2022, though, was really bad. I will totally admit that. It was a rough, it was a rough year. I can imagine. And especially if some of these businesses at the group level are just being spun up or going through a a massive change, right? For uh, listener context, again, I I love that 
not only do you guys have the vacation rental management side, but the snow removal, the cleaning, that's going to help. And you're now able to move your cleaners from contractors to actual employees under this cleaning company. And then you have the private chef experience where uh, you get to have a private chef come in and do all the stuff and they know the property, they know the outpost group as a whole, most likely. So they're able to, again, promote the coffee roaster or the coffee shop and, you know, go into this. And so I think it makes so much sense. But I want to also dive in that you're probably one of the younger executives that we've had on the show. You know, I don't know if you know her personally or maybe have heard of her, but Brandy Canale over at Romy in Miami. Mm -hmm. They're in New Orleans and Miami. They have about 700 properties or 700 units. You know, she just crossed that 30 over 30 club uh, as well, but still like young executive in this industry to where I think you know, th- there's such a a different type of leadership model, different type of way that you embed kind of the way you communicate either with the different companies inside of Outpost or kind of your, your top level leadership. So kind of maybe walk me through your experience. And this isn't your first time even being a, an executive at a young yeah. age. So I guess run me through your experience of being a young executive in hospitality and, and what you've seen throughout the years of, of your leadership. I'm so flattered that you're referring to me as young. For everyone that doesn't know, which is everyone listening, I did turn 30 two weeks ago and it has been a big, a big milestone. Luckily, I feel like there's something with the camera that is making it look like I don't have any wrinkles, but I do. They're, they're starting to pop up. For me, it's going to be the gray hairs I'm seeing pop on the side. So that's, uh, uh, yeah. I've been hitting the salon every eight (laughs) weeks. Like I don't even want to see a gray hair. I'm going to be hopefully still brown when I'm in my 60s which feels closer than any i someone told me the other day they were like well 30 is like when it's half over and i was like what do you mean it's half over no no it's just anyway. getting started i know people that started i start like started a multi-million dollar or a billion dollar uh business at 60 so you know they got plenty of plenty of life left so yeah exactly it'll be good it'll be good okay so i actually started when i was at 360 i was six months out of college. So super, super, super green, 22 years old. And I worked for about three months before my first leadership position kind of fell into my lap. And the message was, hey, we're going to hire somebody to run the reservations and the revenue team, probably from the hotel space. This is back in 2015 when revenue management was really starting to become a big thing that people were discussing in the industry. And everyone wanted the hotel's opinion because they had been doing it for so long. And they said, but can you like manage the team for a couple of months? And I remember going home that night and thinking to myself, like, you are not going to hire somebody else. Like that person is going to be me and I'm going to prove that I can do this job. And to be transparent, I really struggled with walking the line of like wanting to be liked specifically because a lot of the people that were reporting to me were older than I was. And so I think I felt insecure as most 22 year olds do in this new industry that I didn't know really much about at all. I had no type of network other than the company that I was in, which was pretty small at the time. And I just, I had this small team that had all worked at the company longer than I had as well. And I just felt like they knew so much more than I did. And so I took this really soft approach of like, whatever you think is best, whatever you think is best, like the people pleasing approach, which I still struggle with now. But I think this thing that I've learned over time is I'd much rather be respected than I would like. And that has been like super difficult that I still, like I said, struggle with all the time. I'm the person that meets with any type of direct report and for the first 20 minutes, I'm like, how's your life? What do you you do this weekend? Like I love to connect with people in that way, but I also had this incredible mentor when I was with 360 Blue and Key Data and, you know, Jason Sprinkle being one of them who is Mm -hmm. this like gorilla in the industry. And he's also very similar to me. He's super extroverted and like, really wants to be liked and everyone's friend. And I remember he just kind of, he gave me this advice of clear is kind. And Mm. I've kind of taken that with me over the last eight years and have tried to be as transparent as possible with the team. And I still get so nervous before any type of hard conversation or firing or Mm -hmm. I don't know, any type of conversation that I know might hurt the other person on the other end and I think that a lot of that is due to age right like you Mm -hmm. sit in rooms with people that are in their 40s 50s 60s and they don't really have these problems really 30s too and so part of like entering a new decade for me is getting really excited for that like hopefully people pleasing to leave my system a little bit but overall I mean 
I think having this industry has been so exciting to me because I think they're in the corporate world. You don't really have 25 year old executives. You know, you have this like, path that you are required to take where you start as a manager and then you're a senior manager and then a director and a senior and your path for the next 20 years is laid out for you very clearly and you know what steps you need to take and what the salary ranges are. I mean, I think that that provides comfort, which we can all appreciate, especially in times of uncertainty. I think mm. that there's a lot of discomfort in this industry that really isn't as cut and dry, but it's been such a really cool experience because I think I've been given opportunity and challenge that I never would have been given if I would have worked for a company like Airbnb when I first started out. And I feel so fortunate. And honestly, I think that's why I'm still here to feel like respected among peers who have been in the industry 20 years longer than I have and respected by a team of people that a lot of times are much older than I am. And it's definitely been a struggle. Like I certainly will meet with people that are like, are you still in high school? Um, <laughs> but I don't know. That's kind of like a, a two in one answer. No, I, I, I love it. Cause I had a similar experience. I was a hotel manager in my early twenties rather than net where I'm at now. And, and everyone on the team had been at the hotel way longer than I had. I was maybe nine months in. So my, my boss got fired and let go and I took her place Same. pretty much very, very early in and everyone was in their fifties, sixties. Like I was in a really small touristy town in seaside, Oregon. There wasn't a lot of people in their thirties and forties. It was mm -hmm. like, I was a big outlier being in my twenties. And I know you could probably relate to being in Jackson Hole. I don't imagine that's being a, a very young city, but I could, I could be wrong. I've never actually been. My, my buddies uh, talk about their trips to Jackson Hole all the time. So I'm oh going to have to be on one of those. Here. I know. I was going to say I got to be on one of those soon, but you know, you mentioned like being liked versus respected. And I, I want your take on this because I've found, cause I love to connect with people. I open up my one-on-ones and my team meetings with very much a, how's everyone doing? I care about you as a human. I'd rather like shoot shit for five minutes than to just feel like make you maybe have a feeling that I don't care about your life or what's going on outside of work. But I feel like there's a balance, right? Like I, like when you're saying, Hey, whatever you feel is best, right? That I think is a great approach. I love empowering my team where it's like, what do you think? Like, yeah, I can give you my answer and that could be easy for you. Cause then you could just go do it or you can give your opinion and your thought and why you think or agree or disagree with what my decision would have been. And I want you to feel that you can have that voice and feel that, that moment. So try not to like, I guess, ride that fine line of being like a people pleaser versus empowerment. Do you have the same type of, I wouldn't say struggle, but same type of approach when it comes to finding that fine line? Totally. I am like the complete opposite of a micromanager. And I think it's because of the experience that I had early on in my career when it was like, hey, take this and see if you're good at it. Take this and see if you're good at it. Here's some direct reports. Let's see if you can manage them. And they never ended up hiring the revenue manager from the whole hotel industry. And I think that having that confidence early on with people that had been in the industry longer than I had and were older than me that respected me and gave me that autonomy is why I value it so much now. And I think, I mean, leadership is the most important part of my job like by far. I have weekly hour-long one-on-ones with everyone that reports directly to me, which is probably frowned upon by most people. But, and I try to consolidate the number of people who do report directly to me and give them empowerment to have employees under them as well. But I think it's just like, everybody wants time with their manager and they want to run things by them and shoot the shit with them. And I don't know, I just like, I valued that so much early on and still do now that I want, I feel like it's like a responsibility of mine to give it back and to delegate where I can and provide mentorship when I can and guidance, but also to like let the employees fail if they need to, you know, mm -hmm. to learn and not reprimand them when things like that happen and, and just um, give them opportunity to kind of create their own path that and that's what I had, you know, and it's worked out so well. And I think that that's why we all get along really, really well. And the team that I work with now, we're all like super close with each other and talk to each other on the weekends and we don't have to, which yeah. I think is a testament to like when you are transparent and when you do give that autonomy, but when you also have those hard conversations, it does make your relationship better. Like my relationship now with giving feedback to employees, constructive feedback is so much healthier than it used to be five years ago when I would just like bottle it up and bottle it up and <laughs> bottle it up and then finally be like, I really need to talk to you. Like you've been doing this thing for six months that is not 
conducive to a healthy working environment. And then the employee is like, well, what the hell? Why have you not told yeah. me for the last six months? And that it breaks trust, you know, and I don't know. I think that I have learned really hard lessons along the way in a consolidated amount of times. Eight years feels like a long time for me, but it's not a long time for people that have been in the industry for 30 years that I think have been really, really helpful. And I also get to connect with people like you, you know, who have managed mm -hmm. teams and are also in their 20s. I know I'm not in my 20s anymore. <laughs> and that has been such a cool experience too, because I can say like, hey, this is super difficult for me. Everybody on my team is 20 years older than I, like I am, I feel like I'm mm -hmm. fighting for this respect. And I don't want to pull this card, but like even being a woman too is even, mm -hmm. it's even harder in the space, right? And so I feel like it's just kind of been this uphill battle, but I feel like I've, gotten more comfortable over it the past with it over the past year than I have like being my entire career. All right. So you're trying to grow your portfolio and your property management business, but sometimes owners don't have the best peace of mind when it comes to giving up the keys to their home to an unknown brand or company. And of course, let's be honest, sometimes we hear the horror stories of guests and the bad guests that stay in vacation rentals and throw parties. Well, safely as you covered, because not only do they screen your guests that are staying, but they also ensure that you are covered from all things such as ill intent, stupidity, aka vacation brain, and other things like pet damage and theft. While doing that, you are able to partner with Vintory and grow your portfolio with their marketing platform that helps ensure that you are attracting the right owners to your rental program and growing your business in the destination that you are in. Or if you're in multiple destinations, that works too. So get the links in the show notes because both companies have special offers. And if you don't use a link, but you end up talking to them, guess what? Just tell them that Will Slicker sent you from Slick Talk, the hospitality podcast, and they'll get you covered. And you can also let them know that maybe you've heard of them on our platform, hospitality.fm. So of course, like always, make sure you grab the links in the show notes. And thank you guys so much for tuning in to another episode of Slick Talk, the hospitality podcast. Now back to the episode. Yeah, I was going to say, I grew up with five sisters, all, all older. So <laughs> I'm, I, I'm very, like this industry for me, I, I will say like, I, I, again, I'm like you, I don't like to pull the the sex or race or whatever card that, that a lot of people pull sometimes. But, you know, coming into this industry, growing up with all female, whether bosses and sisters and teachers and all the influence I had in my life was females and, and women that were in, in charge and, and growing families and doing all this stuff. And so coming into this industry, you know, not seeing a lot of lady executives and founders and entrepreneurs like they are, but maybe in our, in our media spotlight, they're not as showcased yeah. as much. And so I, I have a couple of questions with you kind of based around the leadership and the execution side, because you mentioned a couple of things that really sparked a, an idea or a question for me. So A, how much of your leadership style today or the way you approach things was impacted by a bad work environment before getting into the industry? Zero percent. Zero percent. Okay. Let's explain. Yeah. It's like dive into, because I, I had a lot of, I wouldn't say a lot. I had a lot of lessons learned through either poor leadership, leadership that was good, but never gave the right time allocation to the team or myself on the team. And just then being a bad leader or a bad owner. So yeah. that's how I've applied a lot of it. Like I'm very, like you mentioned, one of, one of the things like bottling something up for six months, right? And like I've learned that on like real-time correction is really important because someone on my team was dropping the ball and I was about to correct it. And then they did a, a really good success like renewal program. And, and then I was like, well, now I can't say it because I'm yeah. rewarding good behavior with a bad reaction. So that's like an example, right? Like I'm being very conscious of that. Why do you say 0% of your past experiences have impacted your leadership? Because I think 100% of my leadership style is due to my experience at 360. If I'm being honest. Yeah, I think that's right. I'm like checking myself in my mind. But I so I had a female boss for the entire six years that I was with the company she was the CEO and she was like the ultimate badass like the superhero had eventually five kids over the course of those six years five kids in six Jeez. years and was CEO of a multi-million dollar company 
that went through two acquisitions and then sold and mm. just like led with so much poise and she was like so gritty and graceful at the same time and like she would call you out on your shit but she also mm. was like the kindest most respectful person i mean i like can't even describe her in words and i think like i was just totally like enamored by her the entire time that i was with the company and made it this mission of like i'm gonna learn as much as i possibly can and like soak up as much of her leadership style as i possibly can and mm. put my own spin on it um so yeah i mean i definitely had like shitty managers when i i waited tables in college and had like god awful bosses it's funny my my boyfriend now he's a chef and owns his own business and sometimes I'll be like, I have to have a really tough conversation with an employee today. Like, I need to sit them down and, you know, talk to them about this, this, and this and really get how they're feeling. He's like, what do you mean? Like, why don't you just, like, tell them they need to get it together? I'm like, okay. I think it's like working in a kitchen versus working in an office is so different. And so I almost yeah. am, like, detached from my experiences waiting tables and, like, being so horrified by the, like, head wait or the GM at the restaurant or the chef. And now I, like, channel all of this it's almost like this positive reinforcement thing, right? Like I kind of don't think about the negative and only think about this really incredible experience I have. And I said it earlier, but I have this like calling to pay it forward. And I like want to identify people like she identified me and pour into them as much as I possibly can so they can pass it on and pass it on. And it's like this responsibility that I feel like I have now. That's a really good answer. I was not expecting that. So you, you took it a whole new direction, which yeah. I love. That's like, that's why I love these like, impromptu unscripted conversations right just because you never like i can have an idea but what you actually say could be so different and so i love that and you know i have kind of like two more topic slash questions and maybe shifting a little bit of gears but kind of same on, on the same note you know a lot of people in the industry especially 10 20 year long veterans right during covid we're like screw this i'm either getting laid off i'm not taking a paycheck i got furloughed or if you're the founder or someone on the founding team right like you kind of like all right we're deferring payments like we're not paying ourselves until like we're back on our feet and i, I yeah. and i know how that is because i remember not taking a paycheck for almost a year so mm -hmm. like really really different and a lot of people left like i i don't want to work in an industry that's 24 7. i don't want to work in an industry that is behind on not only just being 24 7 but behind on tech or behind on like literally human capital right we were so labor dependent and so you know why have you stayed in the industry i always love asking especially younger executives and, and founders is why why stay in an industry when you could probably go work from home with a SaaS product that's raised hundreds of millions and yeah right well you know do all this stuff there is this level i guess it's like a multi-part answer there's a definitely a level of comfortability that i feel in the industry that almost feels like like home and safe in a way right where i feel like i just like know it so well not only that but like this incredible network that have become friends over the course of the last eight years. I just kind of feel like these are like my people. I've been seeing you at conferences for the last eight years and I like hanging out with you and getting a margarita with you. And um, I don't know, watching it transform and really like blow up over the course of the last eight years has been so rewarding. And um, I think that that coupled with the fact, and I think this is true for a lot of industries, but I guess I'm probably biased at this point, is I feel like there's so much opportunity here still that, and that like drives me, you know, I want to be, I want to be here forever, I think. I don't know. I'm 30. So I still have apparently a lot of life to live, but I do feel like that. Like it just feels like home and it's so shitty sometimes. Right. And now, I mean, mm -hmm. I will be so honest, like at the level that I am in the company, I don't have to deal with a lot of the things that I used to mm -hmm. when I first started out. And I don't talk to guests at two o'clock in the morning and I yeah. don't talk to a lot of uh, like screaming owners. And that I think has a lot to do with it, right? Like I haven't experienced that burnout in a long period of time. It still is very demanding in so many ways, mostly on the employee side and just like mm -hmm. feeling the responsibility of nurturing and growing other young people into building their own careers. But I think this like this industry is so unique for that reason and this opportunity that I've been given that 
I don't know. I guess I kind of have this fear too, super vulnerable. If I went into another industry that they would be like, we have a secretary position open for you. And I don't know. It's like a imposter syndrome type of thing where yeah. I'm, this is the only industry when I could be an executive at the age that I am. So there is some of that. But more than anything, I think I just like I love it and I want to continue growing with it. I will say the amount of experience that you get in this industry is a thousand times more applicable and beneficial for like a corporate company. But again, they're so structured that someone that is kind of a Swiss army knife of experience and knowledge and, and tools and, and leadership experience uh, sometimes is just what they're looking for. Cause they're so structured, right? There's, Oh, you're a Swiss army knife. Well, we have a fork over here. We have a knife over there. And like, this is like, we have individual tools as and not tools so sorry different word but individual tools or uh, uh strategy people in certain leadership positions right we don't need an army knife we need the individuality pieces and so yeah I, i've you know i find that interesting and you said for the next generation because you're you're not dealing with the 2 a.m calls and screaming owners but you're dealing with the team that is right like you have to prevent them from burnout and make sure they're feeling renewed and refreshed so what is your uh, I love this topic as as well too, so we can go deeper too. But there's this new wave or this next wave of of entrepreneurs and executives in our industry. I, I think we're we're pretty quiet right now. You got a couple superstars that are popping up and and doing their own thing as we all kind of need to in order to really come together. But I think there's this next wave, next gen of hospitality leaders that is going to take over the industry by a storm and it's going to hit us overnight one like one day we're all going to wake up and it's going to be like all right this is how we're doing things now yeah uh, what's your what's your best piece of advice for who someone who's young hungry maybe like just like you where they feel more integrator than visionary but have that visionary capability you know going into the industry and building the next next wave any pieces that you would love to pieces of wisdom that you love to to pass down yeah. So my first piece of advice might be frowned upon, but it is definitely like fake it till you make it. When I first started, I remember coming in and I noticed a lot of inefficiencies and I was like, I think that I could probably build this like mega Excel sheet. I mean, this is kind of before the softwares that we have now, right? So I came home and I was like, I'm going to build this big spreadsheet to hold all of our information when we're taking guest calls that we didn't have a sales force at that time or a track. We were using Escapia, but they still didn't have that capability, the CRM capability. Anyway, so I didn't know how to use Excel. So I came home and I watched YouTube videos for an entire week and made a full YouTube spreadsheet and brought it to my boss on Monday, like a week after I started. And she was like, this is the most incredible thing I've ever seen. Like, you're really an Excel whiz. And I was like, yeah, I am an Excel whiz. Like, I've no, I've been doing this for years. And I think you locked yourself into that one. You, I know. And then after that, I was like, oh my God, all these people are going to come up to me and be like, would you mind telling me how to do a V lookup? Like, do you know how to? Yeah. Anyway, and that did happen. And so I did a lot of faking it till I make it there. And now I know Excel really, really well. But I think this like confidence that you kind of have to have, especially as a young person in an industry that's dominated by people that are older than you, that do have a lot of experience, like coming in and saying to yourself, like, the value that I can add is that I have really fresh eyes and I haven't been in this industry for a long time. And I leaned into that so much when I first started with the company. I just thought like, okay, I am going to pick out every inefficiency I possibly can. And rather than pointing it out, I'm going to come with a solution and I'm going to go ahead and like build the solution and just say like, all you have to do is implement it. But do you like it? Like, do you have any suggestions that I think that that really helped me stand out in the very beginning? Um, so faking it till you make it and having that confidence. And also I think my expectations for myself when I started were pretty low. Like it was, I'm going to do whatever I can to make the best out of the situation and position that I have right now. And I'm going to be like the best reservation as possible. And then when I moved over to being a revenue manager, I was like, I will be the best revenue manager possible. And I don't think that I had my sight set on like, I'm going to be a CEO one day. And I think not getting too far ahead of where you are right now is super important because I think we all have goals of some sort, right? Like maybe that is money-based or maybe it is position-based or responsibility-based. And I think just like crush what you're doing at this very moment, even if you are 
in maintenance. Or even if you are answering guest calls at two o'clock in the morning and it sucks so bad. And I think if you stand out and you find those inefficiencies and, and have suggestions for improvement, like all those doors open up for you. I don't know. I never felt this need to like do a lot of really like demanding or heavy negotiating for anything for a long time until I feel like I like had that arsenal built of like in the trenches experience. And that's just something you got to do when, you, when you're just starting out is freaking grind. 100%. And I guess maybe for for listeners, because I, I can I've had conversations where some people, you know, they say like, I don't need to be in like, I they, they excel so fast in their position at such an early stage where like you were saying, I'm going to be the best rev- reservationist that my company's ever seen. Uh, and then I'm going to go to the next piece and do the same thing over and over again. They get there, right? Like they they become the best reservationist. And then they're like, why does no one trust me that I know exactly like everything that's going on in this whole system or this department, right? And I I guess for a follow-up question, do you believe time is super important in this piece? Or do you think that someone can fake it till they make it and get to a higher level or career path in a shorter period of time based off of crushing their positions past, if that makes sense? I think it's like... It's a little bit of both. And it kind of depends on the company that you're in too. You know, there are some companies that have this like intensely tight knit culture where people have been there for years and years and years. And like everyone's kind of an outsider in the very beginning, unless you've been there for a while and you just have to like put in the hours really and build that trust. And I think that's super important. I mean, there were times I would find myself like I'm human, right? Feeling impatient or feeling like, God, I've been doing this for a year and a half now, which really isn't that long, but it felt like forever for 24 year old me. Right. And so I would kind of be like, God, am I ever going to get to the next level? And I remember my boss just saying like, look, it's so important that the team like respects you and trusts you and understands your leadership style and what you can bring to the table. And I just proving yourself is a huge part of that. And I think that Mm -hmm. comes kind of hand in hand with both time and like crushing what you're doing. And I think there is a time and a place to have those conversations about like, what does my opportunity look like? And what does my future look like? I think I will say for anybody that is on the leadership side of things and has already, is already here, right? And has Mm -hmm. like you and I at this point, who our role is mentoring those who are Mm -hmm. now climbing up that ladder. Like what we can do is just always show that there's more opportunity because I definitely would have left immediately if I felt like there was a ceiling over me, whether it be in a certain department or a certain position or just with like the amount that I had to learn. I think that there's something, you know, when you're so hungry, you just want to learn all the time and you want to know there's more opportunity. And the second you put a ceiling over somebody's head, they're out, right? Like they're kind of glazed over when it comes to like the employees that you really want on your team that are super motivated and hungry. And so I think it is our responsibility to like put those professional development plans in front of employees all the time and let them know that like there is no ceiling as long as they're, they're building that trust and working their asses off. Yeah. And I I will say for the visionary people, the biggest thing I struggled with, especially in the beginning with a new or young team, because when it was just like maybe two years ago, when we started our network, it was me and Claire, like I hired Claire and it was just her and I, and we just had to like kind of figure shit out and like, all right, what are we, yeah. what are we we're all doing, we're all doing everything. And then we hired Michael and then we hired Kelsey. And now we have Ginny and now we kind of have like all this stuff. Right. And so for me with a, not, it's not a big team. There's five of us, but with the visionary side, I struggled with sharing the vision more often because yeah. I think I, I didn't want to make it sound like, you know, this raw, raw type thing, every meeting. Right. But in the, in the reality, the people that you, that you hire, that you work with, or that are under you kind of need to have that roadmap in order to see where they fit along the way, not just where they fit today and, and all that totally. stuff. So, yeah. Like you said, like I, I struggled with that at the beginning. And then I had a kind of a one-on-one with some of my team and it was like, Oh, like you want more. And I need to share like what I already, cause in my head, I'm like, yeah, you're going to be this title and position but we're not there yet so but i never shared that with her and And i'll use kelsey our producer for an example when i hired her i was just like hey like this is what i see you doing here's your job here's your role and then 
we had a one-on-one -on -one and I was like, do you even want to do more? And she was like, yeah, I like, I would love to. I was like, okay, I'm just assuming that you would, but I could have been wrong. And Bubba, like, anyways, having those conversations and sharing the roadmap is super important. So I guess, yeah, wrapping up my, my thought there, but Megan, I'm curious, you know, what do you think we, we talked about this on our first episode and we talked about AI and we, for the listeners who are probably tired of AI, promise we won't do it today. We'll, we'll skip it. We'll, we'll skip that topic, but I do, do want to know. want to talk about it. <laughs> I was going to say, we have a message. Go, me. go, go back to the other episode, listen to our thoughts and opinions on it. And then we'll kindly debate because I think you and I have the same opinion, Megan, but uh, for any listeners, I, I know we have a wide range of, of people listening. So anyways, for the industry today, right? I like we, we just got back from a user conference. You see how your business is growing. You hear how others are growing. You kind of get to tune into maybe other podcasts in the industry, X, Y, and Z things, you know, where do you see the next year? Do you think 2024 is looking to be a year of, of success or of, of uh, many fruits? Or do you think we're going to be in this kind of uncertainty window, as I call it, for, for a longer period. I'm, I'm very curious. What do you think the conversations are going to be at Verma? Let's go there. Oh, God. I think a the conversations at Verma, I think, are going to be like, I had a shitty summer. Did you also have a shitty summer? But here's like my advice, really, for everyone, because I think this is going to be a topic for the next year. And I think it's actually kind of a really exciting time. I mean, there are lots of uncomfortable conversations that have to happen with owners and resetting those expectations because the industry and demand is normalizing now to pre-COVID levels. And I think it is going to stay that way for the most part. I think we have this really cool opportunity to take a really deep inventory of our businesses and our current practices, especially right now. It's at the end of the year. Meet with every single employee on your team and perform an annual evaluation and get really, really in-depth with what their year looked like. And as things slowed down for them, because we did see a slowdown overall in demand, like what did they start to notice? What kind of holes do we have in the company? What does our tech stack look like? And how is it serving us right now? Could we make improvements to X, Y, or Z? I just feel like there's so much opportunity to do those deep dives now that we have a little bit of breathing room because for the past three years, we haven't had any breathing room at all. And we've just like been trying to catch every single ball that's been thrown at us for the past three years. And I think it's, it's felt overwhelming and exhausting and so many other things. So using this next year to really just like try to level up and be ready in 2025, you know, like one thing that we did over the past year is we switched over to track from Escapia and we got links and we started having conversations with companies like Price Labs, like just all of these things that we weren't doing previously yeah. that because we didn't have the, the capacity to do so. And now we do. And I think that that is a gift that comes out of a slower season. Slower seasons are great to, and this is going to sound very um, kind of productive or opposite of what it means, but I think slow periods are are great to speed up. And when yeah. I say speed up, I mean like do the things that you've wanted to do, but couldn't because it was so busy. Summer totally. as an operator is crazy. Now in the winter, you get to speed up. Yeah, you can take maybe some you don't have to go into overtime and all this other stuff, but you can now actually do the quality control of the properties and actually do some uh, internal up training with your team, you know, getting them some new resources and tools and education. One thing we've been hearing within the network is just like a lot of people will reach out and say, hey, you know, when I onboarded with X, Y, and Z company, I had to listen to five of your podcast episodes with these people, right? To understand and catch up to the industry. And like, those are, these are great times to do things like that. For us, I know like we're, we're going to be like right after Thanksgiving, it's going to be slow, but it's going to be busy. Like we're going to be cranking some stuff out until January and then we're going to take some time off. And then we all know the next two weeks, uh, two weeks into January, it picks right back up as in, it's just a yeah. nightmare and, and crazy, but I think it's a great time to speed up. So could be interesting to hear. I would love to to hear some, maybe some brands or companies out there that might've been around for 20, 30 years and how they're kind of taking this time and, and the shift in the industry. But yeah, I, I agree with you on, on the, uh, the ability to, to do what you need to in the, the off time. Megan, I guess final question. 
wrapping it up. If you had one thing in the industry that you could change for the better or get rid of, fine, I'll give you two options. To, to change or get rid of completely, what would that be and why? I think that I would change the perception of vacation rentals in the eyes of God, this is really hard. I mean, this is one thing, but the first thing that came to my mind, I would change the perception of vacation rentals in the eyes of, uh, of a lot of communities that are moving towards super strict regulation. And I think that we have had this really difficult uphill battle over the course of the last like five years or so where, you know, We've been doing economic impact studies and we've been speaking to our local and state officials about the benefit that we can bring to our individual communities. And I think this like it just feels like fighting this like negative perception that I wish didn't exist in the first place because I think our industry is so unique and so beneficial to people's lives. Uh, both from like an employee standpoint and from a guest standpoint, because we're creating such incredible memories, but also to the economy locally and at the state level. So I think that would be, that would be my, the answer off the top of my head. Great answer. Great answer as always. So I love to end the episodes with, you know, a shameless shout out plug. Where can listeners connect with you beyond the audio and beyond the, beyond the podcast? I would love to open up that door if you're even opening up that door, but where can they find you? Where can they like and subscribe and do all the fun things that they get Freaking to do? Subscribe. Follow TikTok, LinkedIn. Definitely LinkedIn. I have recently decided that I need to embrace LinkedIn as a social media platform and I cannot be using TikTok like a 15 year old anymore. I don't actually post TikToks. I just like to watch them, but oh, I you love and me, you and me both. Yeah. Also, anyone is always welcome to come up to Jackson, build some snowmen and get some coffee. I'm down. Yes. I'll, I think we should do an in person kind of outpost. I like, do too day that'd be sick yeah that'd be that'd day be in the life yeah day in the life let's walk through all the businesses meet the teams get to do all the stuff that'd be fun try some coffee exactly i'm a coffee i love coffee i'm it's pretty bad i i got onto a call this morning and at like 7 30 7 45 and it was our i was already on my second or third cup of coffee so just tells you a little bit about that i but get you yeah all right megan Thank you so much for being on the podcast again. And of course, thank you. I just, I love getting to talk with you. I think we really hit it off. So thank you to the Sojo ladies, Joy and Marsha and everyone there just for, for telling me to, to interview with you at the travel net conference. So They're amazing. Shout out. But yeah, thank you so much for being on the podcast for yeah, all the listeners. Make sure you like, and subscribe so that way you never miss an episode. And like I always love to say, We'll see you again next week. Thank you so much for listening. And thank you to our show partners for making Slick Talk, the hospitality podcast possible. We hope you enjoy the show and we would love to connect with you outside of the podcast. So you can follow us on all of our social media channels for daily hospitality content or find us on slicktalkthepodcast.com. And don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe so you never miss an episode. I'm your host, Will Slickers, and we will see you guys all again next week.